All right, Anthony. So I promise today's show is not going to be a labor to get through. Wow. I wonder what we're talking about. Uh, Pregnancy. Uh, uh, Mexican food. I don't know, I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Lives. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. We got Anthony Melchiori over there. I, of course, am Glenn Hausman. Welcome to No Vacancy Live. Anthony, so great to see you today, man. How's great going? to be seen, man. I love that. I, lo I love your green screen. Your green screen looks so real. Thanks. And you're, you're in Chicago right there, aren't you? Uh, that is right. It's because um, one of our guests happened to be uh, from that area. And this happens to be his hotel over there right now. It's the Sable Hotel Curio Collection Hotel at the Navy Pier in Chicago. No, Anthony, I'm not in a green screen, but you're telling the guys I rented a helicopter. I'm actually hovering above uh, one of the great lakes. Well, I over actually there. had I had breakfast this morning, and I mm -hmm. showed you the picture where I was having breakfast, and it looked a lot like that background. I was very yes. fortunate to be. Uh, it did well. At least it was. Uh, I was going to say like that. Oh, wait, wait, this part of the screen. Yes. Oh, right there. Just the water. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I couldn't get that going right. Oh, goodness. So it's so great to see you, man. It's good to see you, man. All right. And, so uh, when are we, when, wait, wait, wait. I got to ask you a question. When are we going to the Garden City Hotel? Because you said you weren't going to forget. I did. You weren't going to forget when you got in the car. No, I didn't. I didn't forget. I, I was actually thinking about it this morning and said, I made a mental note that I got to talk to you. And I'm thinking... Uh, you know, we, um, we've got no shows after Monday of next week because I'm going to be going away. Then the week after that, it's taken. But maybe, I don't know, dude. We got a lot of we got a lot of stuff already booked over here. I'm looking at this schedule. But I promise you, I will reach out to the incredible Grady Collin, and we will get there sometime before this calendar year is over. All right, brother. All right. But I'm really excited because today is going to be a little bit different of a show, Anthony, because, uh, you know, this labor issue has been such a big issue, you know, hurting the folks in the hospitality business that are running their businesses. And we already know in some cases rooms are not being sold that could be sold because of this labor crisis. And us here over at No Vacancy Live, well, we want everybody to have successful 2022. And it, the, the keystone to that, Anthony, is our good friends over at uh, Hotel Effectiveness. And what we did is No Vacancy Live partnered with Hotel Effectiveness on a labor perfection toolkit, which is designed to help hoteliers optimize their 2022 budget plans and achieve not 50%, not 80%, nay, not even 95%, but 100% perfect labor costs. So we're going to be debuting a lot of that data today and a lot of the, uh, the quotes and stuff that are in the report were collected by us through some of the different interviews we've been doing over the last couple of months. So let's start off by bringing into the show Mr. Dale Ross returning to the show. How are you, sir? Hey, guys. Great to see you. It is great well, to that, see you, Is too. that a green screen? No, this is actually my wall. That's right. You, ignore the fact that it wall. Your green screen's as good as his. Hey, thanks. I like it. And now and a, a man who does not believe in green screens. He's keeping it old school. <laughs> we got Bob Habib of the CEO of Maverick Hotels and Restaurants whose beautiful property we were just talking about right here. So I'm excited to have both of you on. Uh, Bob, you haven't been on our live show yet, so it's just really exciting to have you over here. Welcome. Thank you. It's our maiden voyage. <laughs> it is. I would like to take a maiden voyage to your hotel. Now, before, okay. Dell, before we get into it, I just want to catch up with, uh, with Bob for one second. Bob, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to at Maverick Hotels and Restaurants, how you're feeling today about the overall state of your business. You know, speaking first to the development side of the coin, mm -hmm. uh, after a hibernation through the COVID period, it was tough to get anything developed, right? Debt was impossible mm -hmm. and, and everything was frozen. And it's like that bear <laughs> has woken up from hibernation. Uh, the markets are hot. There are transactions going on. Development projects that we were working on pre-pandemic that stalled are back active again. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to feel really good about the future once we get past this next couple of quarters, which I don't think are very promising in the industry. Yep. So, uh, you know, uh, you've got this great property. Before we went on air, you said you're doing really well. You've also got a nice collection of hotels up in New England that have been doing OK. You also have a number of restaurants, hence the name Maverick Hotels and Restaurants. Overall, what is going on with you and labor? You know, um, we're struggling like everyone else. There's uh, here's the big headline. The uh, federal overlay of the unemployment insurance has ended and ended in September. 
And guess what? There isn't a resurgence of people coming into the labor market. That's right. So we're finding that this is probably a long-term situation that we're going to have to handle. It may moderate over time, but in the foreseeable future, uh, labor is going to be the big uh, issue for the year 2022. Yeah, absolutely. And Dell, uh, speaking of that, I mean, we're really talking about uncharted territory going into 2002 when it comes to budgeting for labor, right? That's right. Exactly. I mean, to be honest, hotels uh, have been missing their labor budgets pretty badly for about the last five years, just because wage rates have gone up a lot and uh, attrition, you know, turnover rates are really high. So even before the pandemic, labor budgeting was pretty imprecise. Now it's it's just about impossible. It's hard enough to forecast revenues in this volatile market, but getting labor correct is incredibly hard. And, and there's just so many different factors that are that are making labor a lot more right. interesting than it's supposed to be. That's true. A lot of people are laboring over it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you give yourself the, the bump a bump? <laughs> Sorry, I'm allowed to use the sound effects like once a month, so I just, but, uh, you know. But um, I'd like to, Bob, I have some questions for you, but before I do that, I really like to hear the statistics and what's going on and um, really to understand, because we've been, I've asked people every day, like, so how's labor? And we talk about it, but we don't really have the numbers that drive uh, the information. So tell us what's going on, Dell. Yeah, sure thing. Well, you know, um, we our, our private quest at, uh, at Hotel Effectiveness is to make labor boring again. But as I said a second ago, it's really not boring right now. Um, we've got a few d uh, stats here, some of which we've shared before. But here's the updated uh, data. What, so what is, hey, Dell, is that yeah. link, do you know, uh, working right now with the QR code? It sure something? is. Yeah, that, right. that, that link, if you just scan the QR code, uh, it'll take you to the um, the, the budgeting guide for, right. for labor uh, with a, a labor cost calculator. So it's throughout this deck, and there's a URL uh, on the bottom of the screen as well. Um, but that's a free guide that is officially launched on Monday, but it's available today for No Vacancy audience members. Um, so everybody in the No Vacancy family can get this now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this um, this this chart behind, uh, on the screen now is about the uh, the percent of the pre-pandemic labor uh, market uh, in the USA. This we've got we've recovered about seventy percent of of hotel jobs since the pandemic, since the worst stage, which was late late April of last year. We've gotten back a lot of jobs. We gave some of those back. I, um, a lot of the news the last week has been about the big quit in August, and we were not immune to that. We actually lost over 300,000 jobs in the U.S., um, a combination of people, well, actually mostly people quitting. Um, and then attrition's always been a problem. So we continue continually have uh, people walk off the job or not show up for shifts, and that's going to continue to be a problem for a while. We will recover most of these remaining jobs in the next 24 months, possibly not all, and there's some reasons for that, um, but we should get most of those back. Uh, on the next slide, we talk about some uh, other data points. So, Miguel, 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 before we get into that, why do you think we're gonna get that labor back? Well, recovery is expected to continue. Here's the things we know are going to happen. We see a steady progression. Actually, one of the most encouraging things to happen in the last 45 days was that we didn't see a giant drop off after Labor Day, right? After the end of the leisure season and kids are back in school, we expected the lack of corporate transient to cause occupancy to tank. That didn't really happen. We, we saw a minor dip and then it's recovered pretty nicely. So that's that's very good. And if we if as we expect, corporate transient begins to come back in January as it's budgeted and people are allowed to travel and people are allowed to host visitors. That should be very good for us. So that means we're going to see a resurgence of our traditional demand, uh, one of the biggest traditional demand drivers. That means we need staff. Then we're going to get into next March and the next spring break cycle where revenge travel is going to kick in again. We saw what happened this year. There is no excuse for next year being unprepared for a surge of demand in mid uh, mid-March, taking us all the way through into the summer. So we need to be planning for that now and building our plans in our budgets accordingly. Yeah. Uh, but what do you think is going to make people, when we talk about the big quit, why are they going to, for lack of a better term, unquit? Why? Where are we going to find these 30% of people miraculously? Where are they going to come from? A couple of challenges there. We are learning a lot about uh, how to recruit and onboard. We were we as an industry, we're so desperate to find people that we didn't actually do as good a job as we normally do uh, onboarding, but in making sure people who joined us, who largely had come from outside the industry, 
making sure they knew why we were here, the purpose of hospitality, the purpose of lodging, and the critical role we play in society. We didn't do that. We just handed them a housekeeping cart and said, good luck. Right. Um, that didn't work well. So I think most of the management companies that we work with are really taking a lot more time with the onboarding process and making sure people really buy into the purpose as much as they learn how to do the job. I think right. that'll help. The other thing is we're learning a lot more about sources of labor and how to use it more efficiently. Anthony, you'll love this stat. This is not in my chart, but did you know that 30% of people in our industry in the, U in the U.S. who are eligible and want 40 hours a week are not getting 40 hours a week of work? That means wow. we've got, we've got a, a, a massive pool of labor that already works for us that we could tap into. We're going to get better at that by being a little bit smarter and more flexible about the, the timing of shifts and the, 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 the way that we uh, schedule people and the flexibility in those jobs themselves. That's going yeah, to but I also, but not to interrupt you there, but, 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 but be honest with you, um, I think some of those jobs aren't going to come back because people don't want how hotels don't want to clean rooms every day. No. One, they'll save the environment, but it's because they want to save labor. Unless you're here, like in New York City, the union uh, in the contract states that you have to clean every room every single day. It's in the contract. So outside of that, most hoteliers don't want to clean the rooms. I was talking about yesterday that I'm starting to hear that uh, brands are pushing or owners are pushing brands to charge for, for, for cleaning rooms. So I think that that percentage of housekeeper is not coming back. Well, some, to some degree, you're right. And housekeeping, uh, stay over cleans account for about 10 minutes of, of labor per occupied room. And right now that number is way, way down, right? We're actually only cleaning about 25% of the stay over cleans we were cleaning pre-pandemic. And wow. it, won't, it won't come back to, to, to uh, the, the original levels. But here's what's, what is actually going to happen. Upscale and luxury hotels are making stay over cleans an opt out thing. That's already happening. So we're going to see a lot of that business come back and only about 15, 20 percent of people will opt out of those stayovers. For every other chain scale, we're going to see opt in in some cases for a fee. In many cases, I don't think the fee will hold up because it right. just takes one company, one hotel in the market to not charge. And, you know, that goes away, but it will be opt in. And we'll see probably about 30, 40 percent of people opting in for those cleans, um, especially on the leisure side. We actually also learned a lot about the impact of not cleaning rooms during a long leisure stay on departure clean times. All the savings of not, not cleaning that, that room during the stay were more than uh, made up for by wow. excessively long clean times when they checked out. Wow. All right, Bob, I got to hear what your response is to all of this, uh, this data drop. Bob looks like he's about to explode. Uh, he's ready to, he's ready to talk. <laughs> I know that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot there. Um, I think we're in a reflection point as an industry. The article in this morning's Wall Street Journal talked about business travelers complaining when they show up at hotels and they say, yeah, I get a free breakfast because of my status in the hotels. He said, you sure do, but not today, pal. Right. Um, and th there is a backlash that we're seeing that we're going to have to restore some of these services. Mm -hmm. The flip side is, I think that we, we're at a point where room service and daily maid service and these other things may not come back the way that they once did. And I, I think the labor shortage, I have my own theory on what's driving the labor shortage, but it's, it's partly because we've had these baby boom generation that stayed in the hotel labor market um, 10 years longer than any generation previous. Right. And in the pandemic, they went home. And that's a huge number, just statistically a huge number. And we're going to be fighting the labor fight um, in the foreseeable future. I, I, uh, I think it's here to stay, if you will, in, in lesser degree. I agree with Dell. I think it's starting to moderate, but it's not going to go away. No, I, I think it's going to be here for a very long time. But I'd like to get your opinion on what do you think the reason is that people aren't coming back or people aren't coming back in the hotel. What is your, what's your opinion on it? Uh, I think that uh, we've learned a lot about uh, our employees through this period. A lot, some of them left the industry. I've, I've personally talked to former employees that went to Amazon and for 15 bucks an hour, they're working these really easy assembly line and, and collection jobs. I talked to some folks that, that um, have recentered their life and said, I don't want to come back. I want to stay home with my kids and right. be a better parent and try and find a way to make the economics work. Um, I think that uh, some folks have left the market. Um, right now, they're just fearful. If, if you look at the vaccination statistics, there's still a big chunk of this country that's not vaccinated and, and uh, is trying to avoid congregate settings. So right. I think all these factors kind of, it was the perfect storm. 
Yeah. And, and, and I think what Dell said before, it, and I'm glad to hear you're saying that the, the companies you work for are doubling down on training and onboarding because that is the critical. And listen, my daughter got into the hotel business during this transition and she loves the team that she's working with. And that's, and she never really wanted to get in the hotel business or has a love for this business. She got on it because wedding planning wasn't, you know, going, she got out of school and it wasn't happening because of the COVID and she got into it and she likes it because of the team and the onboarding process. And I think that that is the critical point because I think there's going to be less line employees in more supervisory positions than we've ever seen before, because you're going to have that, um, you're going to, you're going to have a whole division of, of jobs in our industry that are going to be gone. And I think you're going to have a supervisor because they can do more jobs, right? So you're going to call this person a supervisor and they'll be able to do two or three person jobs. And if you don't train them and pay them and take care of them, they're, you're going to, you know, work them to death for a, for a year or two and they're going to leave. If you do it right, that person will become your general manager. And, you know, it's, 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 I think we've done a poor job underlying bold with really taking care of our frontline staff in this industry. That's my opinion. And I think now you're seeing the, um, now you're seeing uh, what what's happening. They're not coming back. Sorry, was- I think that was exacerbated by the pandemic because yeah. honestly, as an industry, we, we ended up going from Thanatos to Eros so quickly and people, we weren't able to, to keep their, uh, medical coverage hold. We weren't able to give them any kind of continued income. And we forced them to say, Hey, I thought you guys were all about, you know, uh, the people and, and hugs and, yep. and teamwork. And when the chips were down, the industry kind of bailed on us a little bit. And wow. that pushed some people into a, into a different career. Yeah, you, know you, Rob, you said that, that I think that's perfectly said. It is. And I've been hearing this on all these news groups and stuff like that on the social media sites. And I'm really impressed that you actually said that out loud. A lot of folks in your position are pretending that is not the case and are blaming folks on being lazy, for example, yeah, and not yeah. wanting and they, to work. Yeah. yeah listen, um, you give me you give me an option to do something else. I might take it like it happened in my career a couple of times and I took it and it worked out for me. And right. I think that that is critically important to, to admit. And also, like I said, I don't think a lot of companies did a really good job of taking care of their housekeepers and their, their, mm-hmm. their frontline staff. And I think they're saying, why, why can't I go to Amazon and make 15, 16, 18, 22 dollars an hour. And there's opportunity to become supervisors or management. And, you know, and when you say you work in Amazon, you know, it's like, Hey, that's a pretty good name. That's a pretty good company. So you feel good about, and you hopefully you have pride in the company you work for. So, Dell, I'm sorry. I um I know you enjoy your graph, so I want to see here. I know I want to see the data. We're going to get right back to the data, but I want to make sure that you guys tell PJC Pockets that she must get her children to go into the hotel business. Well, PJC Pockets and I had a bre- beautiful breakfast this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, PJC Pockets, I'll get you a job anytime you want, baby. <laughs> and, and PJC, uh, there are more manager jobs open because um, we always have seen line level roles turn over like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. But this year we saw manager turnover that we've never seen before. Assistant general managers from May and June were turning over at a rate of that would have led to 100 percent attrition in the year. Now that that slowed down, but AGMs were being burnt out and they were also seeing that their bosses, their GMs, the job they aspired to were working even harder and doing even more thankless tasks than they were. And they were pulling the ripcord and switching over and becoming super shift supervisors at Amazon distribution centers. So, yeah, listen, yeah, we've yeah, seen it. We've yeah. seen it on this show, Dell, where we're looking at. We won't mention anybody, but we're looking in the souls of of presidents and general managers and vice presidents, and they can't hide it. Yeah. They're shot. Right. They're shot. Yeah. All right. So PJC was talking more about her daughter or PJ's daughters. I don't know if, uh, who PJ is. Um, uh, the PJ's daughter team. should go into the hotel business. We've talked about it a lot on this show. Uh, good opportunities for advancement. Bob, if somebody's coming in straight from college, well, are they going to advance pretty quickly in your organization? Oh, absolutely. You know, the, the, there's two things going on. One is obviously there's uh, constriction in the labor force, but beyond that, there's a generational shift. The baton has been passed to a new generation that's got to be tech savvy. One one of the labor solutions that we might see in the future is 
there, there are now apps that are like Uber for hotel employees where you sign up for a service, not a hotel, and you're dispatched to the hotel based on when you want to work. So you might be at the Hilton on Tuesday and the Marriott on Wednesday because those are the days that you want to work next week. I mean, there, there is there's great opportunity for someone that's that's born of this generation. Are we, no, are we really getting to that? Are we really getting to that? Yeah, I mean, we, we are. I mean, we, we've got a gig economy right now that's booming. Uh, and one of the things that we've done, we enabled a, 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 um, a technology part of our labor management system to allow managers with multiple hotels in the market to pool their labor to actually allow this gig t- economy to happen, but across hotels. And then post open shifts to an available pool of direct employees. They can pick the shifts they want at multiple hotels. And that's actually working and, and allows that kind of flexibility that people are demanding whose alternatives are DoorDash and, and Uber and any number of other gig type economy jobs that pay pretty well, but give them absolute control over labor, over their right. hours. Right. So, Dell, how is this affecting what people are being paid in the hotel business? Boom. Wages. <laughs> yeah, well, we know they're going up. I just wanted to share some of the latest information. So these are the most popular positions in, in, right. in hotels today. And you can see that across the board, wages are up against 2020. Something that's remarkable there, 2020 wages were ridiculously high compared to history because only the most tenured people were still left, right? So being above 2020 is a big deal. They aren't gonna come down ever, but they're gonna keep going up for a while. Room attendant rates, uh, the, this is the national average, 1377. I promise you, Bob's not seeing 1377 an hour in Chicago. Absolutely not, right? In major markets, we're seeing rates that are approaching 18, $20 an hour, starting wage for, for room attendants. Uh, just to get them. And they're having a hard time. New York City is $36. <laughs> New York's his own planet when it comes to labor. That's all, it always has been. And it's going to go up. So this is another thing that has to be accounted for in the planning process is rising wages. It also means you can't afford a static staffing model that you used in the past. When, when demand and occupancy were really predictable. So Tuesdays always looked like Tuesday, right? They are always the same. You could probably reuse a schedule week after week after week. If you do that now, and we see these kind of volatile dips that we're seeing all the time or spikes, you're going to either be grossly overstaffed at a massive cost premium or understaffed and you damage the guests. And it's also, Bob, and you can probably talk to this, you know, it's also, if I'm looking at a hotel that is a, looks like a good price that is already a hotel that's been built and working or a new build that may be a couple of dollars more, but I can get the efficiencies into the new build and take care of like maintenance. I won't need as many maintenance people. Maybe I won't need as many house per, uh, persons because I have a laundry chute. So you can really look at this labor graphic and really say, you know what? Yes, it's going to cost us a little bit more to do it this way. But if you look at the labor and you take it out over 5, 10, 15, 20 years, it more than pays for itself. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that when you're designing a hotel today, you, there's a whole new set of uh, parameters that you have in your mind as it relates to making the hotel labor efficient and so on and so forth. And then the future, you hear people now talking about robots and, and everything else, uh, kiosk check-in, robotic room service delivery. Uh, you know, I, I think that's, for the moment, a bridge too far, but I don't think it's far-fetched. Right. Yeah. I, I think, I think, Dell. I'm sorry. What do you think? I think. Look, it's it's absolutely true that, that automation of some of the mundane tasks is happening. It will happen, but it's there's so much low hanging fruit right now that doesn't require automation. It just requires eliminating waste and inefficiency and enabling a much more uh, much higher level of visibility about productivity of our workers and and tools to help enhance that. Um, that's right. what we really really need to do first. There will be ways to replace human labor with with technology, but right now robotic vacuums can't pick up socks. Uh, we don't have a toilet cleaning robot that can actually move from toilet to toilet and then clean itself. We don't have that today. Um, we have all these tasks that, frankly, the automation requires more labor than the tasks they're replacing. So that will change. But for now, the better answer is let's just challenge the way we do working today, which really starts with. Yep. Labor planning and scheduling. Um, and okay, so get, I'm sorry, Glenn. Uh, no, I just wanted to address uh, Garland Lou is asking about what's the name of the labor app. Just scan that code right there, Garland, and you can get the uh, 22, 
2022 planning guide and labor cost cap. And the product is called Perfect Labor. That's our labor management uh, suite. It's the anchor of our, of our product. It's an amazing tool that's very, very needed. Yeah. You know, how do you, Bob, how do you take a generation of people that are managing the new generation with this mentality of, of gig work and, you know, I don't want to work overtime and I don't want to take that extra day. When we were growing up in this business or somebody said you want to work Saturdays and Sundays, you, they didn't wait for us to say yes. They already put you on the schedule. You know, they expected us to do that and say, thank you. May I have another? And as they're whipping us and, and we were like, okay, no problem. You know, I only work 20 hours today. I can work 22 tomorrow and I don't need to eat lunch. So, but how do you take a person like us or maybe even a little younger than us that doesn't understand this new way of thinking and get them to match? Cause I always have been a person that I like to think that I'm a young thinker and I think like my team and i'd like to think that i'm pretty open-minded and creative and i'll do whatever if, if you're a good person and you work hard if i need to give you a flower every day and carry you to work i'll do it um because i know how important really good people are so are you seeing that with the older generation trying to manage the newer generation yeah anthony i i think youth is, is a state of mind more than it's the number of birthdays and i know a lot of people in our business that couldn't let go of the past and, and I had a guy that I had to let go not long ago. And I said, look, if you want to if you want to wear bell bottom pants and dance to disco, that's your business. But the rest of us have moved on. And I think that's um, mission critical for people that expect to stay in this business. The pandemic only exacerbated the need for work life balance. It uh, the future is going to be very much all about people getting the schedule they want, the days, 40 hours a week. Um, when when we were young pups and and work seven days a week, 60, 70 hours, because that's what was expected. That that was the uh, the standard of the time. That's That standard isn't there anymore. Yeah, and, yeah. I'm, glad, and I'm glad you said that out loud, and I, and I think you're exactly right. It's a state of mind. And listen, this morning I had breakfast with my friend PJ Pockets. I'm going to go pick up my daughter later. You know, I'm talking to you guys, and I get to, I get to manage my work-life balance. I could never imagine – having to work a 40, 50, 60 hour week where I have to go and commute into the city anymore. Right. I'm past that. And if I was 25, I may have been past it because I'm 25 and I'm growing up in this economy. So, but people judge people because, oh, they don't work hard. Well, are you supposed to work smarter or are you supposed to work harder? Because I worked harder. I didn't work smarter. But nowadays we just had this, com I had this conversation with maybe somebody called PJ Pockets this morning that said, um, well, they should show up to work because the coffee guy in the corner expects it. And, you know, we need we need the transportation, people to pay for transportation and people should just work, you know, come into the city and work because it helps the economy. I agree with that. But if you have kids at home and you want to work life balance and you want to see your kids soccer game and you can work home from home efficiently and productively, why not? Uh, I'll tell you, if I can just chime in, the thing that I've learned it, through all of my career, especially now focusing specifically on labor, is that people do care about balance. They really do. But what they care most about is they want to know that they matter. They want to know that what their, their job is about is something that they care about. And as I said earlier, that's something that we've kind of missed out on in the last year. We, we really haven't done as good a job making sure people knew how important the hotel industry is and how critical it is to provide a safe, clean, comfortable place to stay with to people who are not at home and can't stay there. That's really important. And, and right. that will actually transcend some of the other, you know, uh, frills and, and benefits that less uh, meaningful jobs may offer that, frankly, some of them might even pay more. Right. Bob, Bob, I want you to answer that. But I also want you to address this question that we're getting from friend of the show, Andrea Stokes over at J.D. Power, labor pooling. What do you think about that? I think labor pooling is going to become a necessary evil. It's, it's again, something we would have never thought about 10 years ago, but it goes back to that the notion of like the Uber app for employees and, and cl uh, hotel clusters where you're exchanging labor. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, it's going to be a need. It's a necessity in, in the near future. Yeah. It's happening Excellent. right now. It's happening yeah. right now with, with yeah. hotels. That's why we created this coverage finder app. We realized that with all this labor on the sidelines and unused labor in the hotels, it really wasn't a labor a, a labor crunch, a labor, we can't find the labor. It was, we can't find the coverage that we need. So by changing that and realizing we have lots of labor that we just aren't tapping into very well, including our sister hotels, 
uh, we've been able to help uh, hundreds and hundreds of hotels with just who have multiple properties in a single market. And it also lets employees see, hey, I work like if you look at uh, let just take Highgate, for instance, here in New York City. You know, they have so many hotels in New York City, have low scale, upscale, all kinds of scales. Why? Why not use that pool? And you go to maybe you work in one hotel, Midtown, then you work in another hotel. And you're like, oh, there's a position open in sales in this hotel. I really like this hotel. Mm -hmm. And there's there, it really gives you a tremendous opportunity to see what else is out there and also doesn't get you bored. One of the things we know in this industry, and I've said it before, we all have all kinds of OCD and and we we all have all this energy. And you want to put, you want to take a kid that has all this energy and put them in the front desk for two years, they're going to lose their minds. So having them run through the city in different hotels, I think is great. Different hotels, different jobs, right? Cross training and being able to work. Different yeah, right. And you know, you know, what's interesting, Anthony is you're reconnecting the employee to the management company as opposed to the property. Yeah, so if, if I worked at the Hilton downtown, that might be the way I perceived my role. And if, if using your example of Highgate, if, if I'm being moved from property to property, I work for Highgate. So the, the management company now has to reestablish that identity with the employee and make yeah. them feel part of the broader team. That's a great point. It's like the military government. It's like, you know, you may move, transfer, go here, go there. I think that's a great point. And again, five years ago, I, I'd be like, you're all out of your friggin' minds. Yeah. But it, it's not only, not only like even before this conversation happened today, was I like, I don't know, can that work? It's almost like that, that not only should work, that should be the standard. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So uh, our, our friend, uh, John Foley, man, good to, good to hear from you. He was just at the IHGA owners event. Newport Hospitality at Fargo operates 50 plus hotels. They're convinced housekeeping labor shortage, all about daycare. Sorry if you covered this. We talked a little bit about it, but very specifically, I'm hearing that more and more and more. Bob, are you experiencing that? How are you coping with that reality? Yeah, I, I do think that's a factor. Um, I think that one of the decisions that people were forced to make during the pandemic was the, the work versus stay home. And the government made that decision really easy because right. when you look at what they were able to collect from unemployment, in many cases, they, they were getting rent waivers and other things. It, it made that um, the math work for them. And now that they're looking to come back to the workforce, many of them are, are uh, looking differently at, at the whole concept of their commitment to their family. And I, th I think the future, uh, we'd, we'd all be well advised to look at, at things like daycare and uh, child care and and other things that help people achieve a better family work balance um, to attract them to the workplace. Dell, are you seeing that? So it's absolutely true that child care prevents people from taking jobs. And it is a very, they even have bigger challenges than we do with attracting people because of so much of that business, it requires a subsidy and they can only pay certain amounts. But I will tell you this, the, the there's a workaround that many might be able to take advantage of. As we talked about, occupancy is all over the map. It's, it's fluctuating wildly. And we have high occupancy days and low occupancy days. It used to be that it's a matter of, of biblical principle that you must clean rooms after the guest departs, right? You clean right. them that day. But now what we've learned is that if you have a high occupancy day, that then you have checkout, and then you have two low occupancy days, rolling rooms and actually having housekeepers come in at night after their kid's other care provider is home from work can actually give you access to labor you didn't have before. And then you have the room ready when it's needed on that next high occupancy day. Rolling room strategy is actually the next frontier in making better use of the labor you already have and unlocking new labor sources. So Bob, I have a new business for you. Go into okay. the quietest vacuum in the world business. That way you can vacuum rooms at night and not disturb the guests. I oh, that's, like that, there you go. Yeah, I feel like that Dyson dude is probably on that one. Uh, yeah, we need to get sight. We need to get stealth yeah. vacuums. Uh, I want to get back to you the know, uh, the charts, but I'll, I'll the throw end. one more more curve in that housekeeper conversation, which is uh, the industry has a direct um, benefit or or uh, to immigration policy, right? This is a gateway industry. First generation Americans come here. Many of them work in hotels in these jobs. Uh, Government policy has been to choke that supply off over the last couple of years, which has contributed to this situation. Saw a stat uh, once that one in five uh, hotel workers in Chicago was first generation American. And to the extent that those valves are opening again, that may offer us a little bit of relief. That would be that would be great. Now, Colleen is saying that uh, 
goes around, comes around, childcare was bad in the 70s and 80s. I disagree. I like my parents not being home. I had access to Coca-Cola cookies and cartoons. I was really happy uh, on there. Yeah, if you but, had the um, internet back then, that'd be a problem. That would have been a huge problem. Or, you know, maybe a, maybe a savior. Dale, what's going on here? Hours per occupied room drop more than 25%. Yeah, this is this is kind of going back to something we were talking about earlier, which is the uh, the return of labor. Um, before the pandemic, a select service hotel uh, occupied room required a little over two hours of labor, and a full service hotel required a little over three hours. That dropped like a rock, mostly because of food and beverage and stay over cleans. Right, those jobs, food and beverage job, almost entirely went away. Most of those will come back, especially as the catering and meeting segment comes back over the course of the next eighteen months. Dale, yeah. please, please, before you go forward, please explain what you mean by the uh, two hours per occupied room so people that aren't, don't do this every day like we do understand what you're talking about. Great point. I'm not even sure. Yeah, so it's um, – you remember how when RevPAR was created, revenue per available room was used to enable you to compare one hotel's uh, revenue performance against another, even though they had different number of rooms and configuration – so hours per occupied room is the same way of enabling you to measure productivity and and uh, uh, the labor requirements of hotels, one hotel against another, even though, again, they've got different occupancy rates and different uh, sizes. So HPOR is hours per occupied room. It's a good way of it's a good basis of planning in this planning tool. We actually give the benchmark HPOR data for every br major brand. Uh, in, in the country in every asset type. So we use that as a baseline based on projected occupancy to give you what hours you're going to be expected. And then we use the local market wages, which we also have access to. We have over 5,000 hotels providing real-time data and project the actual cost for the period that you're forecasting. That's in the tool that that link uh, gives free access to, to the customer. So it's a labor forecasting tool, but it's all based on this idea of a, every time you have an occupied room, it requires a certain amount of labor measured in hours. Right. Fascinating. Bob, do these numbers look about right to you anecdotally? Yeah, they do. Um, I think that the unknown is we've, we've been using the pandemic, and I, I hate to say it's an excuse, right? But right. We, we have done, made a lot of adjustments to the way that we manage our labor because of the pandemic out of need. And consumers are getting less tolerant to that. They're expecting now that the pandemic is starting to wane and, and we need to restore some of these services. And I think uh, that's going to impact this in the future. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Anthony, you said yesterday on the show, people are learning to live with COVID and we're getting back to it. This is a side effect of the learning to live with it. Our expectations are back, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I know when I'm going to hotels now, Something's going on with your internet. You're totally frozen there, Anthony. So uh, let's go to let's uh, let's take you out for a second. Go to Dell. So um, yeah, the, the the there's no question that the labor is going to come back. And the biggest mistake we could make in budgeting now is to try and assume that you're going to see 2.1 hours uh, of labor required for for upscale and full service hotels next year. If you do that, you're going to blow through your labor budget by mid the midpoint of the year. Um, that's why a dynamic staffing model, a dynamic planning model that actually adjusts with projected occupancy is really important to adopt. If, if, if people do nothing else, they switch from a static model where you just have a fixed cost that you're projecting to a dynamic one that, that moves and directly um, it aligns your, your cost, not as a percentage of revenue, which is a really flawed way of budgeting for, for labor, but as a a, an hours per occupied room or a unit of cost per occupied room. That's a much better way of doing it. If we budget that way, we're going to have much more accurate and usable budgets going forward. Glenn, how am I doing now? Better? You're perfect. Yeah. Well, I am. I know. Thank you. Um, can you tell me? <laughs> and the reception about? is good too. So, so <laughs> what, you know, I find myself now, again, I know the business really well. I feel the pain of everyone, um, but I'm over it. I walk through a hotel and I don't care. Like I care because of who I am in the business and what I've done, but as a customer, I don't care. Like I want what I want when I want it because I'm paying the rate. I'll pay more. I'll tip better. I'll do whatever you want me to do, 
But if I want breakfast, don't tell me there's no breakfast in the hotel. And I have to – now, if you're a hotel like in New York City and there's no breakfast and I'm in Times Square, that's fine. Because I'll go across the street to Starbucks, you know, and, or I'll whatever. I'll, that's not a problem. But if I'm in a place where I have to get in an Uber to go get breakfast, that's a problem. And um, even in Vegas, you know, Vegas hotels are big. I don't want to leave the hotel to go get breakfast or stand online for three hours. You know, many times I'm in Vegas and and um, I just order room service because the lines at the coffee places are too long. And I order room service and room service is there. Uh, Anthony, so- I totally agree, man. I, that reminds me of when we were there last week. I went to go get coffee downstairs at the hotel I was staying at. The line was 50 people deep for a cup of coffee. So I went to go meet you where we were doing our broadcast that day. There were three people online. So I yeah, felt like you know what? if I was a general manager of a hotel and I had, I still had lines in my hotels, right. I fire myself. You've mm-hmm. got to figure it out. You've just got to figure it out. There's got to be a way you can't be wait. We're, we're all so in a rush that that's crazy, right? We're all in a rush to get everything done. We have no time for anything. We don't have time to think, but we have time to stand in line for coffee for two hours. I don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, think like, that, Bob? I think that leaves general managers in a tough spot <laughs> because I, right. I think that we are all mentally um, broader than just our business. We're getting panic, uh, pandemic out, right? We're done with it. Yeah. We want to get on with our lives. We're, we're over all the restrictions. Add to that all the factors that we've talked about in this call and the fact that you just can't find people in those roles. And then the, the wage inflation. And I know a lot of people are going to empathize with this. When you present your budgets to ownership and you show wage inflation, the way that it realistically is going to appear next year, they act like you're from another planet. They, they, right. they don't want to hear it. Um, and that leaves general managers in a bit of a difficult position. And that's why you need general managers that speak the truth. There's so many times in my career that I've walked into a room and I'm always in, you know, people always mad at me, but I don't care. I'm not doing, I'm not doing the general manager mm-hmm. dance. The general manager dance, Glenn, for you may not know, is about May and June, you start playing. Say, right. ah, we're going to kind of decrease the forecast for September and October, November, December. Oh, if September comes, oh, right. you know, September doesn't look so good because what you did in January, February, March, April, and May, you lied to everybody. So now you got to make it up in the last quarter. So right. we need more general managers that aren't afraid to get fired and go. It, dude, it's it's like a standard in our industry. Right, it is. Like it happens every day. Matter of fact, ninety nine percent of the budgets that are submitted are are changed because people are giving the owners what they want, and because they're getting pressures from vice presidents of of management companies. And uh, but I want to go back to what I said before, Bob, when I said that general managers fire themselves to those lines. There's so much technology right now that I would make people like Glenn when he's checking in saying, hey, what time do you think you have coffee in the morning? Nine o'clock. Great. Hey, this is the app. Please use the app. You know, put 915, 915, your coffee be ready. Thank you very much. There's a way to do this. And it's like we're all just like brain dead. When it comes to this, these big lines for coffee in the morning in these big hotels, I don't get it. But anyway, so Bob, as far as forecasting and budgeting, am I, do you agree with me? No, I totally agree. I think that, it, that we're at a, a point where we need to deal with the truth. Um, and the truth is the industry is in a tremendous state of flux. Products like Glenn, or I'm sorry, like Dell's are, are uh, in big demand because you need to manage your business scientifically. We have to embrace technology in a, in a much broader spectrum than we have in the past. Every every other, if you look at retail and the impact that technology's had on retail, it, it's mind blowing. And the hospitality space is next up, and we're going to have to find ways to more efficiently serve our guests and schedule our employees and use technology for all that it's worth. So, right. so Dell, the question to you is: Can they handle the truth? <laughs> you know they can. And and here's the thing: I I have nothing but respect for GMs. I realized very early in my hotel career that I never wanted that job. It's just too hard for me. Um, but what I also recognize is these guys, their their quest for the guest is unceasing, and they need better tools. What they need is they don't need more tools and more screens and more math. They need more tools that give them that take away the guesswork and show them the the areas they need to focus on. Um, and and what to do next in the areas that is not about passion and love and, and experience, right? And that's some, one of our biggest findings in the last year is we re-engineered a lot of our tools to not give a great looking report, but a great looking report that says, and this means you should go do these three things. That has been gold. It saved a lot of time and it's made our tool, which is already used by thousands of hotels, a lot more useful. Right. And most general managers are didn't come from the finance department. Right. 
<laughs> they came from the front desk, a housekeeping, food, beverage, where they don't want, they don't like it. They don't like sitting in an office and doing scheduling or doing budgets and stuff. You know, I mean, how many times have you seen a general manager that came from finance and you're like, where is he? Well, he's in his corner where he likes to be. Yeah, we, we, have, a, we have a special term for uh, people in the hotel industry that like math. It's a revenue manager. <laughs> right. right. The, everybody else likes people. And so we need technologies like our technology is for people. It's for humans. We'll take that experienced person like Bob's talking about. Like, Anthony, Bob, you if I showed you a, a, an occupancy forecast, you could tell me how much housekeeping labor was required for that in your sleep. You just know because you know it. we would take that and we would turn it into a, a, a labor standard, a, a staffing algorithm. That then populated by the guests that then the newest manager you just hired last week would schedule exactly the way you would with none of your experience that's what technology has to do that's pretty cool bob no, that, that's why revenue managers should be and are becoming the highest paid people in the hotel because to manage your business effectively in the in the marketplace today you need to be all over that one bob, and i was sitting in a meeting um i don't know years ago and i've said it on the show before and I said, the highest paid person in this room is going to be the general manager in 10 years. So Miss Director Sales and Mr. General Manager, which was me, um, we're going to be outpaced by the, the revenue. And more important than being outpaced in salary wise, the owner is going to call them more than they call us. And it's true. A yeah. revenue manager, if you have an owner group that's really involved in their hotels, they just want to speak to the revenue manager and then tell the revenue manager to yell at the general manager. <laughs> yeah. Why did he lie to us about September numbers? Yeah. So well, uh, now, actually, because no, that's when the revenue manager says, "Listen, boss, I know the general manager is my right. boss, but I know you own the hotel. He's making. I've been in those meetings. I've I've got myself in trouble where I've said, listen, they're asking the, the the management company's telling me to lie to you. I can't lie to you. So so when you have a good revenue manager that has a good relationship with the ownership, they'll tell them the truth." Yeah, yeah the, the science can be the man the general manager's best friend because the truth of the matter is goes back to your Jack Nicholson analogy. Owners can't handle the truth. And I know I'm on both sides of the table. I get it. Um, after two years of losses, they want the general manager to come in and paint a rosy picture for next year because they're at loss fatigue. And the science is their salvation, which is here's the market, here's what's happening in the market, here's the way we will perform against that marketplace that should make you feel good about the job that we're doing, and it's the, and here's the result that it leaves us with. You know, and that's funny because, you know, I know kind of getting the weeds here, but my partner, Jeremy Pinkerton, who's, who's the revenue manager of, of the business, she worked at the Western Hotel where I was the asset manager, and she would walk into these rooms where, again, Tishman, great company, but tough company to work with, especially when you're running their flagship hotels. And she gave them the facts, just the facts and only the facts and the reports and the science of what we do. And being, you know, an emotional channel manager, most are, they're not good at explaining what you just said, because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble. They're afraid they're going to disappoint. That's the worst. The old manager's afraid they're going to disappoint the ownership. Whereas a revenue manager, a good revenue manager is like, hey, here you go. You make the decision. This is it. Whereas a general manager is not capable, most of them, of really trying to take the, the emotion out of the numbers. Yep. Makes sense. All right. So I do want to encourage everyone to take your phone, hold it up to the screen right now, get the free copy of your 2022 planning and budgeting guide the labor cost calculator available to all of our listeners and viewers today. Now, if you guys are listening to the audio feed, go to hoteleffectiveness.com slash 2022. Dale, we got one more slide to talk about over here. That Average was prices. easy. That was yeah, easy. right. Boom. Look there how you go. Boom. It's in. And if you want, if you miss the QR code, it's still there on the screen, just a little bit tinier. Click on it while Dell's talking. Dell, what do you got for us here? So this is just a, a snapshot of use of overtime. So there are four sources of labor that hotels use, and this is a broad brush. You have your salary workers on which we've put a lot more burden in the last 18 months, right? We know that. We have our hourly main workforce, which is usually about 60% or so, or 60, 70% of labor, depending on the market. Mm -hmm. We have contract labor, mm -hmm. which is used in, in some markets. It's, it's the majority, depending on where you are. And then we have overtime. Overtime is not our favorite, right? In some cases, it's better than contract because at least it's our people. They do things our way, but it's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. um, we know that historically, keeping overtime at about 2% of total hours is a good 
benchmark. It's a good target for a healthy use of overtime. Circumstances vary, and there's good overtime and bad overtime, but that's a good rule of thumb. We have seen overtime usage just shoot through the moon in the last couple of years. Um, right now, we're looking at about 4% of all hours is overtime. And actually, this is because we are not able to use the full-time hours that are available within our, our existing team, like I mentioned mm -hmm. before. We can't get contract labor because the contractors are having problems hiring people. Um, and the managers are simply burnt out. They're already spending 20, 25 hours a week cleaning rooms and checking in guests. Right. They can't give any more because they still got to run the hotel and recruit people. So, and Glenn, and Glenn yeah. you, know, you know where the line for overtime is in the budget? Uh, it's not in the budget. <laughs> when you find it, let me know. Yeah, if, right. If you went to an ownership group and said, well, I have a line item for 2% overtime, they'd be like, um, does you have another general manager behind you? Because you're now relieved of duty. <laughs> right. So, it's important that we talk about this. You actually do need to recognize. Of course you do. Labor and budget for them, or at least have a story about, here's how we're going to make a decision about when to use each of these sources you need to have a decision around that if you may not get buy-in for the budget but if you get buy into the the way you'll make those decisions that'll save managers a lot of grief when it comes to budget review right excellent that makes a whole lot of sense believe it or not we're starting to run out of time over here so uh this has been such a crazy quick hour and i want to give everyone a chance to uh wrap up and stuff like that so Dell, what are the takeaways that you want people to be thinking about after we go off air? All right. The world has changed, and the way that we budget obviously is different now. It needs to be different for labor. So we're encouraging people to use, take advantage of zero-based budgeting. That's a nerdy way of saying you, you experience the worst case, base case scenario back in the April 2020, April 2020. We can build on that and build a, a true, sustainable, supportable budget from that. Use benchmarks, performance benchmarks. Don't don't just guess at how a hotel like yours should be run and how much labor is required. Use benchmarks. Use dynamic scheduling and staffing models that flex with your projected occupancy because we know that there's going to be volatility there. And then, really important, make sure you're paying attention to recruitment and retention, particularly Project, uh, predictable reten retention issues. We've actually created a retention risk dashboard, dashboard because turnover is predictable. Pay attention to that when you're in your budgeting process because if you don't budget for retention issues and turnover costs, again, you're going to have a negative budget surprise in a year where we really can't afford them. Well, right. you know, we got to talk about this a lot on the show with you, and you have to come back as much as you want because – the biggest problem I find is that general managers don't know how to convince ownership that this tool is important and why it's important. And again, we tend to be an emotional bunch, so we don't really get into the nuance and the science. And and really, I know me, I'm not able to explain stuff like this well to ownership. I always get my revenue manager, or the smartest person in the building to explain it because I always get emotional and say, I need it because I need it. Thank you very much. I'm writing the check. And I won't say what I say, but and then I go back to work. But so it's really important. But what's the one thing, and Bob, this question for you too. But what's the one thing of all the analysis you've done, all the things coming out of here? What's the thing, Dell, that has surprised you the most? That when you looked at the numbers and you're like, I didn't expect that. What was it? Wow. Um, so I think the, um, the 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 most surprising thing, and it's not that much of a surprise if you think about an ancient industry like ours, but the the most surprising thing is the resistance to change, right? People saying, yeah, that's all right. I'll get to that eventually. I, I, I know I need to adopt a dynamic approach to labor planning. I just don't have time right now. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, a housekeeping shift is costing you more per month than the, 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 a tool like ours, which is the best in the market. What are you talking about? You, of course you have time. You have 15 hours a week where your, your GMs are cleaning rooms. They don't have to do that. We can free yeah. that up. It's, a, it's, the it's the same person that tells me they don't have time to interview people. Why can't you interview people? Because I'm in new resources firing the people that somebody else interviewed. <laughs> Bob? Bob, what do you think? Gosh, um, I think that the most surprising thing to me is where, where did they all go? Uh, when you, when Again, when you look more acutely at the labor shortage, it's not just our industry. Everybody you talk to in every industry tells the same story. 
I've got a buddy who's a, a police a police chief in one of the Chicago suburbs, and he said that all his officers are working overtime because this suburb, suburb steals from that suburb. You can't find people in, in um, jobs uh, to fill jobs across the economy. And and I don't know whether the, the aliens zapped all these people off the face of the earth, but something out there is just really off. And, well, and just, just, go to, just go to people's basements and find them uh, all the kids in the basement. No, and, you know, and I would think that the military, maybe the military took them all, but no, they're having trouble too. They can't find any. Yeah. Nobody wants to go in the military. It's 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 really is it's it's fascinating. It's funny, funny you say that, Bob, because I feel the same way. They all go. Everybody's got their own Etsy store. To, Everybody I talk to has a job. Most kids yeah. don't have a job. Everybody has a job. So where do people, where do they all go? Right. Yeah, very true. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here. Bob, give ourselves an amazing plug for yourself or for Maverick, whatever you want. Or for me or Glenn or wherever you else. Want. Yeah, Anthony yeah. doesn't need any plug. <laughs> well, you know, we're um... – we're off to a great year this this year with at Maverick. Our, our existing hotels are doing well, but but bigger than that, our development pipeline has has reignited, and that's another whole story. Which is, you can tell that the market feels like we're we're coming to a more normal time, in spite of all the things we're talking about. And and we've been a very active um, developer in the in the new marketplace that's now just barely 60, 90 days old. Right. And Bob, we're going to have to get you back on to talk about those type of issues at another date. Thank you so much for being so open and honest about what you're experiencing with this labor crisis. Uh, Dell, what's your shameless plug? And I'll bring this up here to uh, aid the. Uh... So everybody should go and just download this 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 uh, guide. It's really straightforward, very consumable. Uh, you know, it's not going to be something that requires a Ph.D. And then this tool for calculating budget, it's available to you. You'll like it. It's a simple calculator that works pretty well. So go use that. And then just a quick advice is if, you, if you're one of those people, like most of us are, that got into the hotel industry because we love people, but we don't necessarily love math, but you also want to make sure that you've got an airtight approach to your labor costs, work with us. Hoteleffectiveness.com. Perfect labor is used by one out of every five hotels in the U.S. today to manage the biggest cost item. We'd love to work with you. Yeah, no, you said something that's really important if you're going to be a general manager or a revenue manager or running a hotel is when you're talking to an owner, be airtight. Like go in with the facts. Go in with the facts. Leave the emotion outside the room. It took me 30 years to figure that out. Um, and just be airtight. And when you don't think you have the time to talk to people like you and say, hey, why should I have this tool? And really analyze it. Then you know what? You got to stay a little bit later at night. You got to come in a little earlier because we're all so busy being busy in this business because it's 24 7. When my friends tell me, well, I work so hard, I said, dude, when you go home at night at six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, you're home. You know how many calls I've gotten at four o'clock in the morning in my career? Okay, I've got more calls at four o'clock in the morning than I haven't gotten at four o'clock in the morning. You know, it, it's every day for the, my whole career. So we are busy, we are overwhelmed, we are emotional people in this business, you need to sit down, spend the time and understand what Dell's talking about. Because once you understand it and once it's it's airtight, you can then go and you can you can present it to your ownership and you have the facts and you've done the best you could. So even if you don't come in on budget, you're doing the best you can. And that's all that owner can ask you. Yep. Beautiful. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Have a great thank afternoon. You. Take care. Bye, Dell. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And because the shameless plugs are so popular, we got Suzanne with her very own. Hi, everyone. So here's a shameless plug of the operations management and hospitality. This is the first hospitality specific operations management textbook that's out there. Our guest today, Dell Ross, was actually a integral player in writing chapter seven that I wrote. So maybe you do need a PhD for some of this, um, but organizing staff um, and hotel effectiveness was a key player in um, helping us to write this chapter for this book. Great resource found on Emerald Books. Wow. I should See? get that book. I really should get that book. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. Thank you, Suzanne. My we'll pleasure. talk to you later. All right, Anthony, I got to get going because I've got a meeting in a minute. Oh, 58 seconds. So let's let's get let's get out of here today. What do you say about that? Any final thoughts uh, that you want to summarize today with? No, sir. All right, everybody, download that guide. I'm going to put it up on all of our social media sites as well. So you can just click it and get it right there. But 
If you're out on a walk, don't forget, you can listen to our podcast on audio files. Listen on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, wherever you like to get your shows. Of course, he's at Anthony Hotels, and I am at Traveling Glenn. And here's that link, once again, to download at hoteleffectiveness.com slash 2022. Right, everybody, thank you so much for being here. Remember, you all got one life, so blaze on and be kind to yourself. See you tomorrow.